And so we'll uh, take a minute to connect with uh, an altruistic motivation using Shakyamuni Buddha Mantra. Tai Ai Tai Om Mune Mune Maha Mune Soha Tai Ai Tai Om Mune Mune Maha Mune Soha Tai Ai Um, sorry about my accent. Okay, so at the bottom of the page, we're looking at the Mahayana family. But um, before, we, before we go into that, uh, Monday we talked about um, the other types of family. So we talked about the disconnected family, that family that, uh, you know, people are very habituated to negativities and a bit rude and uh, the the possibility for um, transformation while they're in that stage is quite limited. Then the people of the indefinite family who basically go with whatever the authority figure is in their life and uh, take on the path that. Um, and then we had the here and the solitary realizer family, which are of the foundational vehicle seeking their own motivation. Um, so before we go on to the Mahayana, did you have some, some thoughts about any of those things? Those, those previous types of family that we talked about, just the like the whole concept of this teaching of uh, kind of dividing people up a little bit, um, of classifying them in this way, of exploring the whole idea, whole idea of how quickly or slowly transformation will happen. How did the whole premise sit with you? Um, was it uncomfortable at all? Was it interesting, useful? What is the difference be between indefinite and the se two seconds that come, two ones that come afterwards? Uh, the, the difference between the disconnected and the others are pretty much more clear. And I think it's useful to understand that there are people that right now cannot do a lot, but you can start with little gestures that can open something. Uh, it sounds uh, very pessimistic, yeah, but uh, I think it's realistic. Um, yeah, yeah, and I mean, you know, this is only one of the families, you know, it's not like everyone is in this disconnected family. Um, but in a way you could think of um, even some other sentient things like maybe ants or uh, spiders or you know beings like that who right now transformation is hard whereas beings who are mammals maybe you know dolphins i don't know whatever there is a little bit more potential for them to um, create some positivity you know by looking after their young and different things like that um, so it's, it's not sort of saying that um, anything is forever, but it's, it's just kind of a clear assessment that, all right, let's not beat our head against the wall. Let's just do what we can to help the, this person do anything positive whatsoever. And if they really can't, then my job as the person who is uh, trying to quote help is just to maintain a connection with them in some way, just from the heart, not necessarily in relationship, not necessarily in conversation, but to never kind of psychologically shut the door to anyone. 
um, you know, there's sometimes people in our life that we need to realize it's not helpful for them and not helpful for us to remain in each other's lives. But if there's a way we can do that distancing without ever shutting the door to it, um, that's an important part of the Bodhisattva path. So this disconnected family, um, how you work with folks of this family has to be quite individual and case by case. It can sound a little pessimistic, um, as you said, and, and realistic, because we have met folks like this. Um, and they're rare, you know, it's, it's rare to find a person who has no compassion. It's rare to find someone with no compassion. It's quite common to find people who forget their compassion and get distracted and, you know, whatever. But someone who really is showing no compassion is quite a rare creature. Um, and even they are not a loss, we just are remembering that uh, it's gonna take a while. So disconnected family, I think, yeah, we're pretty clear on that description. Would you guys agree that one's clear enough? So then this indefinite family, um, as the text says, I think, let's see, yeah, that um, they d the nature of the indefinite family depends on contributory conditions. If they attend a hearer spiritual master, associate with hearer friends, or study the different hearer texts, then those persons will awaken in the hearer family. Basically, they are very easily influenced. So people of the indefinite family are going to become like the people they surround themselves with, in particular, the teacher that they have. So this isn't necessarily a good thing or a bad thing in the beginning, um, but it's, it's like I said on, on Monday, that it's lacking a little bit of personal responsibility. It's lacking a little bit of emotional independence. Um, and if you're that easily influenced, it's easy to get distracted as well. Um, this is something that you see a lot in Dharamsala in India. Maybe some of you went there after the army years ago. Maybe you have kids who do that. Um, where uh, people are really seeking, they're really on a spiritual path, um, you know, and also, you know, want to go to coffee shops and have relationships and smoke pot. But, um, you know, people go to Dharamsala and they get inspired by a teaching somewhere that they meet. And then they hear from their friends, oh, there's this other teacher who teaches in this way. Oh, they do Zogchen, it's really cool. And so then they go to that. And then someone else says, oh, did you hear? There's this retreat center down south. We have to go there. Oh, let's do this yoga thing. Oh, let's do this. Oh, let's do that. And basically, they just get swept up in whatever their friends are doing, or they get swept up in the reputation of a teacher, or um, they just happen to wind up there, so that's what they're doing. It's a completely normal stage, right? And it's completely fine for a while to do a bit of this, like, shopping, you know, bit of shopping, bit of cherry picking, I'll take a bit of this and a bit of that. Um, but this indefinite family is not somewhere that we really want to live forever. Because it lacks um, power and it lacks a lot of, um, well, I guess the danger is, is that you're never sure what you believe, you just are trying to believe what others believe. And so then if you're all by yourself doing retreat all by yourself, what is left? Um, I think people of this family are very prone to pack mentality. Um, you know, kind of going what, with what their peers are doing, even if what their peers are doing is not necessarily uh, beneficial. Um, there are some Dharma organizations that um, get dysfunctional because, um, because everybody is kind of whatever the authority figure says must be good and true. And then whatever everyone who's in the in crowd is saying must be good and true. And there becomes like a culture of not being able to have constructive criticism. You know, it can happen in any organization, religious or otherwise, but um, it can happen in Buddhist centers as well. So this indefinite family is very much about um, uh, easily influenced by authority, easily influenced by peer pressure. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if we're meeting someone of this family and we are the authority figure, what happens? Yeah, if we're meeting someone who's easily influenced and we become the person that they just say, yeah, whatever you say, whatever you say, I'm gonna do that. Does this happen sometimes in the clinical setting? It, you know, does it, it happens, you know, for me in the teacher setting sometimes, but I'm sure it happens to you where sometimes someone comes into psychoanalysis 
and thinks that uh, you're, you know, the source of everything good and pure and wise and whatever you say, they're like, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. Yeah. Is there a danger in that? Have you seen that? How long does it last? Maybe, maybe it will last till they will find another authority figure that uh, other friends will say to them, go to this guru or this uh, therapist. Exactly. Yeah, it's exactly. Better. His method is better. Many, uh, maybe try CBT now and uh, something else, you know, another method. Exactly. Exactly. I, I've, yep, exactly. Um, I, we could, uh, I don't know, groups of, um, spiritual practitioners or people that live an examined life or people that are somewhat alternative. We can get into this with like a uh, health stuff. I don't know if this happens to you, but my friends and I are always talking about, Oh, did you go see this Ayurvedic doctor? They're amazing. Oh, did you go see this Tibetan doctor? They're amazing. Oh, I just got acupuncture. Oh, I just did this. I just did that. And all these different kind of like alternative health things. Um, and you know, once one of the nuns goes to a certain acupuncturist or, um, I don't know, shiatsu or something like that, then we all go. Yeah. <laughs> it's totally a human thing. It's totally a human thing. Um, but I think that, you know, when we're with someone like this uh, to try and, to try and skillfully find ways to encourage their own empowerment. Do you know? Uh, you know, Yuntan, we were just yeah. uh, studying with Ranan uh, <coughs> Coates' first book. And this chapter is talking about uh, archaic, idealized self-object transference or relationships. And uh, it can uh, suit this kind of uh, uh, viewing that the, the patient may see us as... Uh, uh, as the indefinite family uh, view, yeah? Whatever we say or give us, uh, you know, great power. Now, as therapists, uh, we sometimes should uh, take this role at the, at the beginning, uh, at least, very carefully, of course, but uh, if this is his need uh, at the beginning or uh, if in this way you can uh, uh, start to grow differently, uh, so maybe it's a very important first step. Um, so, uh, and uh, maybe also like you described the Buddha, we're not Buddha of course, but uh, he also speak to the person at the level he's at. So maybe you wouldn't say to that person uh, right at the beginning, hey, take a personal responsibility. Maybe he, he would feel that uh, this uh, man at this stage need that kind of uh, spiritual leader or... Yeah, yeah, certainly. I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm with you. And I think that the difficulty is the transition. Yeah, the difficulty is the transition when someone is moving from being of indefinite family to being of something that they've taken ownership of, someone who's become empowered to make their own choices and feels empowered about their own choices and now is choosing to see the teacher or the analyst or whatever, they're choosing to see them in a certain way right? and have this interaction in a certain way with the background knowledge that this is a human being who I will see human faults in. And that doesn't mean that their content is faulty, but I can awaken my wisdom mind so that the inner guru is collaborating with the outer guru or you know, <laughs> the inner wisdom is collaborating with the wisdom of the outer analyst. You know, that, that, collaboration has been invoked in a more obvious way, in a more, you know, concrete way. The transition between just tell me what to do, just tell me what to do. And actually what you tell me to do, I want to marry that up with what resonates. Yeah, and I'm actually gonna have some detachment from that, examine it and then decide whether or not to take it on board. I think for me as a teacher, this is always an interesting place of transition because, and I think that it must happen with you guys, the way transference happens of um, there is a certain type of person that wants to put you on a pedestal. 
They want to give you all of the power for their life. They really want to. And the question is, should you take it for a while if it's skillful or should you nip that in the bud right away? You know, it's so case by case, isn't it? But if you decide to take that on, this sort of, you know, archaic self-object, is that the right way to talk about it? If you decide to take on this role, it's so dangerous, right? It's so dangerous and it can't be that way forever for most people. So then what do you do with the transition point? You know, because they might decide to do that transition before you think they're ready and they basically have put you on a pedestal and now they've flicked you off and now you are nothing and therapy is crap and to hell with it or um, Buddhism is stupid because you're a regular person who drinks coffee, <laughs> right? You know, so, so this can happen to us, can it? And um, I think that's a really interesting place to explore is the transition point. Um, do some of you have some experience of that, of when it's gone well or when it's not gone? Someone has kind of given you all this power and then gradually becomes more independent? If it hasn't happened yet, it's gonna happen, right? transference of different types. I, I wanted to say that I think, um, continuing what Uli said, that I think when you hold it, um, the therapy is helping the person be who he is, bring out his qualities. You can hold it a little bit differently. And uh, even if you tell a person things that give advice, but if it comes from empathy, you actually, um, understanding very deeply the patient's needs, then it, it's, it's helping him be him in a way. And it can be done more gently, the past, the going from him not knowing himself to him knowing him um, that way. Yeah, that, that, sounds, that sounds like the approach we should take, definitely when you're kind of giving some sort of, um, you know, for lack of a better word, advice, that it's really like with this very deep empathy, as you describe, where you're trying to listen for what is the wisdom they already know, but have kind of hidden from themselves, that you can kind of expose to them. You know, you're exposing themselves to themselves, their wisdom mind. And then once that wisdom mind is kind of activated and is driving, then there can be a better collaboration that's a bit more free flow but in the beginning, it, it has to be a little bit more um, delicate, yeah, or as you say, gentle, where you're really kind of peeling back, like, where are they at, actually? You know, what can they hear of themselves, actually? Because if I um, kind of inspire them to do more than they're capable of, then eventually they're going to get disillusioned and burned out and leave the whole process, even if in the beginning they're having this kind of a certain, you know, surgence of health and well-being and whatever. It's a bit like if you do a crash diet, right? And you suddenly get thin and gorgeous and you're like, woohoo, but actually you didn't change anything fundamentally and a year later you're twice as heavy, right? Um, you know, it's a similar kind of thing where you can get people to be kind of healthy through the power of your inspiration for a time limited way. If it's you feeding, force feeding them your wisdom, but because it's not theirs, it's not going to stick. Yeah, anyway, this is just my opinion or my impression, but uh, it's something worth sitting with. So then there was a, oh, sorry, Karina. Um, I think I, it's very important to, to, to realize that um, it's the, um, the patient need, not the analyst need. If it turns to be the archaic need of the analyst, there is no analysis going on. So we are talking about the need that arises in the patient. And the analyst, and that was called big discovery, is not self-cherishing. He knows that it's not him that is being idealized. He is not the all-knowing one. Okay, but there is a need of the patient for somebody to be able to know so he can be calm and well held. And that's a big difference. So if the, uh, um, if the analyst is not confused and self-cherished by it, there is no problem. Absolutely, and, and I think that, that uh, you know, all the problems we see with power abuse and authority abuse come from, you know, whoever it is who's getting that kind of archaic self-objectification, um, taking it on board as truth, right? And thinking this thing that they think I am, the source of all wisdom and knowledge, 
actually, that is me, ha ha, you know, and then they start taking advantage of the power that they've been given and, you know, chaos ensues and destruction ensues. Um, and, you know, I think that you're all reasonable, kind people um, who have enough humility to realize whatever the patient is projecting on you is their projection. And so if they think that you're the, you know, center of the universe and godlike, you're not going to go, oh, I agree, <laughs> you know, that we all hopefully know better. But the, the tendency of um, once someone kind of wants to give you all the power to just take it and say, say, sure, I'll tell you what to do. You know, it's, it's still a danger, even if we don't have that um, ego thing with it of thinking that you're amazing, amazing. You still, you know, often I'm sure when you're with patients, there are things that you want to tell them and you hold yourself back, but you know what, you want to say, maybe stop going to the pub every night. <laughs> you know, you maybe want to say things like that. And um, if they've given you the power, it's hard not to say it or know when to say it. So, so this indefinite family, in a way, they're a more uh, delicate thing for us when we meet them. You know, the disconnected family, we just do a bit of an assessment. Can we help or not? Is there an opening to connect or not? And then, you know, gently disengage if we need to, leaving the door open. But it's not such a um, continuous issue. Whereas the indefinite family, there's going to be this whole thing of how they respond to authority and their need for authority and et cetera, all that kind of stuff. I think it can be a much more delicate place to navigate. Um, yeah, so then uh, there was a question that popped into the chat that said, um, what is, uh, why, why is it called the hearer family? The next one down. So the hearer family is of the foundational vehicle type. They're called hearers because their main way of learning is through going to class and hearing, right? So um, some people learn, you know, primarily in one way, um, and then the other ways are more um, incidental. And some people learn in all the different kinds of ways, but it's a bit like, um, you know, old discussions we had in the 80s and 90s about learning styles. Right, you know, some people learn more auditory, some people learn more visually, some people are more tactile. You guys have heard these kind of learning style theory conversations. Um, in this case, this is someone who hears by, who learns by hearing, um, going to class and having that interaction. Then solitary realizers are just as the name would indicate. They don't need as many direct one-on-one -on -one teachings. Um, they have they're riding the wave of previous habits. And so they only need a few teachings to kind of inspire them to continue the path and kind of um, to make connections and things like this. So they're people of quote, higher intelligence or sharper faculties. But really what that means is they've done more work in previous lives. So they need fewer explanations for them to progress. So that's the main difference between the hearer and the solitary realizer family is they're both foundational vehicle seeking their own liberation, seeking nirvana only, um, but one of them uh, needs more handholding than the other. Does that make sense, the distinction between those two? Yeah, and again, it's not like a, you know, moral issue or a looking down issue. It's just a kind of clear assessment of um, who is in front of me and what do they need. Yeah, and um, some people are incredibly insightful and you know it right away when you meet them and they, they basically need very little from you except to, to mirror what they already know, right? And some people really need a lot of um, different strategies to wake up their wisdom and it needs to be a lot more um, engaged in a more obvious way. Thoughts about that or questions about that? No? Okay. They, it said that they are a bit arrogant, the solitary realizer family. Yep. Addition, in addition, they are, they are arrogant, keep their masters in uh, identity secret. Can you think of kind of real life, real life examples of that? You know, people, people who are uh, very confident of their own ability to um, take on things and to transform into things and maybe in a way can't hear anything from anyone. They're like, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. I mean, we might get into this personally, especially um, 
especially when we come across a teaching that we've heard before that we understand intellectually, then our pride gets engaged and we go, I know, I know, I know. When of course you do know intellectually, but you haven't integrated it. And the repetition is essential. And the fact that you're getting the experience of um, a dynamic, real time, live conversation about it is actually really rare and powerful and important. But your pride overpowers you and says, yeah, I've heard this before, next, next. Yeah, so all of us can get into this kind of thinking very easily, especially once we've heard enough Dharma or enough psychoanalytic theory or enough of something that we get the basics, it starts to sound familiar. Then our pride talks over the top of our wisdom and says, you already know this, move on. Bored, right? This can happen to any of us. So this kind of arrogance, um, you know, intelligence and arrogance don't have to go together, but they often do. Yeah, so we all need to watch out for that little sucker because we're smart cookies and we have to be listening in a different way than just intelligence. Because um, as you know, as I said many times, once you understand something, then you can start. Your intelligence says once you understand something, then you're done, right? So once you understand something, then you can start. And then you can hear it again with different ears, the ears of how do I use this, not the ears of what is this. So um, yeah, so there's a real danger there with this arrogance. Um, can happen to us all, right? Okay, so uh, yeah, any more about those previous families before we go on? Okay, so the Mahayana family, the bottom of page 11. What kind of family is the Mahayana? The summary? Classification, definitions, synonyms, reason it is superior to other families, causal characteristics and marks, these six comprise the Mahayana family, and then it fleshes it out on the next page. So page 12. This family has two classifications. So there's just like the foundational vehicle has hearers and solitary realizers. In the Mahayana, we have the naturally abiding family and the perfectly workable family. So that's the subdivision or the classification. So the definition of that is, um, second is the explanation of the respective essences of these individuals, not inherently existent essences, right? But just tendency. The naturally abiding family has, from beginning with time, had the potential to develop all the Buddhist qualities through suchness. And then the footnote says, that is in a natural, uncontrived way without the exertion of effort and practice. The perfectly workable family has the potential to achieve all the Buddhist qualities through the power of habituating themselves in root virtue. And the footnote says, this category refers to those who can develop the Buddhist qualities with practice. Thus, both have the chance to achieve enlightenment. So what's saying here is that there are folks who, um, you know, beginningless time, if you were to kind of put a point earlier than now, you know, eons earlier than now, didn't meet with as many conditions that um, escalated their ignorance. So that means that Buddhahood came more naturally and quickly to them and they kind of, you know, they were a regular sentient being with a clearing, knowing consciousness, innate ignorance, Buddha nature, just like us, but they met with fewer conditions that escalated their ignorance and their negative states of mind and their karmic seeds that would lead to suffering. And so they kind of, you know, became Buddhas right away. Yeah, so this is what's being described here. In a kind of real life, in immediate, in front of us sense, um, there are folks who have had not too much suffering, not too much trauma, um, lots of resources, lots of support. And so then if something happens in their life down the track, they have a lot of resiliency. They can go to therapy for a couple of years and they're okay. Yeah, pretty quick, done and dusted. You know, as opposed to some folks who didn't have those same resources growing up, need to be in therapy for 20 years, slowly, slowly, right? Um, so this is kind of what's being described here. There's folks that, that the conditions around them didn't um, make them develop negative qualities, negative states of mind, negative karma. Therefore, they had very little work to do to just become enlightened. It was a much more natural process. So that is not us. 
<laughs> that is not us, right? Because we're still here sentient beings suffering in samsara. But it's nice that there's a whole bunch of Buddhas out there that didn't have the struggle, right? Because <laughs> they can help us now and they're doing their best. Okay, so then this perfectly workable family, um, hopefully this is us or becomes us. Um, they have the potential to achieve all the Buddhist qualities through the power of habituating themselves in root virtue. The key word here, habituating. Yeah, again, 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 again. Yeah, so basically, you know the right thing to do. You do it on purpose. You do it intentionally. Again and again, it creates momentum. Yeah, make, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so synonyms, this is just other ways of describing it. Synonyms of family are potential, seed, sphere element, element, and natural mode of abiding. So you probably don't need to think much about this unless you're reading other texts about Buddha nature and you come across these terms, you know it's referring to family. So superiority, which is a you know, confronting word. The hero and solitary realizer families are inferior by virtue of the fact that they fully purify their families by dispelling only the obscuration of afflicting emotions. The Mahayana is superior because it fully purifies its family by dispelling two obscurations, afflicting emotions, and the subtle obscurations to enlightenment. Therefore, the Mahayana family is superior and unsurpassed. So afflicting emotions, right? Afflicting emotions, they are two types of afflicting emotions. Those that are naturally present, those that are intellectually acquired. Okay, so we have all of these habits of afflictions born from our innate ignorance, right? We have anger, we have attachment, we have jealousy, we have pride, and they're just the natural result of having this innate ignorance about the self. The self seems to inherently exist when it lacks inherent existence, right? The classic, here's the problem, now we have all these unfortunate habits because of it. So this, the afflicting ignorance or the afflicting emotions that are natural are just those natural habits that we've developed because of our ignorance. There are also afflicting emotions that are intellectually acquired, which are the result of bad tenets, meaning you were taught bad beliefs. You were taught things that were not useful to your path, took them on board and believed them, and now that's another part of the problem. So the example given in the traditional texts is people that were brought up to believe that animal sacrifice will lead to liberation, or that washing yourself in sacred water will purify negative karma. Right, so those are, those are um, examples of um, bad tenets um, and ways that you achieve intellectually acquired afflicting obscurations. Now in modern days, I would say very gently, <laughs> some of our ideas um, in our, with our uh, new age brothers and sisters fall under this category. For example, the thought that uh, emotions are wisdom. Emotions are not wisdom, right? Emotions are information, <laughs> right? We can look at that information in any number of ways, but do you have friends that say, if I feel it, it must be true, right? An intellectually acquired ignorance. Um, certain ways of believing in astrology might fall under this category. So um, there may be an influence of the planets because of karma, because we created this world system through our karma and there's a relationship there. There is things about astrology that might be conventionally true. And there's a whole bunch about astrology that is probably nonsense. Um, and uh, we give ourselves permission to stay with certain negative behaviors because we are a Scorpio, right? <laughs> Right? So it's only fair that I'm obsessed by death because I am a Scorpio, right? <laughs> right? That's why, right? So, you know, we do this kind of nonsense though, don't we? These are intellectually acquired afflicting obscurations. Okay, so we can think of other examples, like maybe even certain kinds of therapy might have been things that we were learned and taught that actually turned out to be dysfunctional. Um, worst case scenario is people that have been indoctrinated by a cult. Right? People that have been indoctrinated by a cult, the, the ways of thinking of that cult would be intellectually acquired, afflicting obscurations. 
Does that make sense? The two different kinds of afflicting obscurations, that which just all of us have naturally because of our innate ignorance and those we've learned because we've come across teachings that are actually faulty. Yeah. Can you think of some <laughs> examples you've come across of that? You know what I mean? We call this bad tenants, but you know, it's basically things we've learned that are not true or helpful actually damaging. This is different than thinking that things that we've learned have led us to what we know now, right? So I, I guess an important sidestep is to realize that even if we did certain kinds of therapy or we did certain kinds of spirituality that now don't serve a function, but were really important and useful to us at the time, we don't need to look down on those, right? They were steps on the path. So it's, it's a different thing than thinking that was bad tenants and I need to shut them out. You, you know, as, a, as someone who's an, living an examined life and has some objectivity about their own learning, we can see that maybe knowing that then was a very useful step to what I'm learning now. Yeah, so, so don't, don't take it the wrong way and think that you know, previous belief systems are necessarily bad tenants when in fact they might have been really excellent steps along the path. Because in Buddhism itself, emptiness is described in many different ways um, according to the needs and abilities of the people who meet those teachings. And so we have different tenant schools within Buddhism, some of which say very um, contradictory sounding things when in fact they're a sequence. Yeah, they're a sequence that we go along in terms of practice. So you can think of, you know, I don't know, maybe it was very useful to be a new age hippie when you were 14 years old. Maybe it was very useful to, I don't know, buy lots of incense and, you know, frolic in the forest and have no shoes and do all that kind of stuff. It's a very important part of your understanding of interconnection now and you don't have to look down on it at all, right? So, so don't misunderstand, yeah. It's if you're holding to bad tenants and they're still having an influence on your life in a negative way. The negative way that we're really talking about, meaning that you don't understand cause and effect. Right? The worst tenets you could have are thinking that negative destructive actions lead to happiness. Right? Or that positive beneficial productive actions lead to suffering. That would be the worst wrong tenet to hold. Right? Is not understanding natural consequences and cause and effect. Questions? Okay, so then the other thing described here were subtle obscurations to enlightenment. So these are sometimes called um, obscurations to omniscience or um, knowledge obscurations, depending on the translator. And basically these are um, what prevent you from being all seeing and all knowing. So these are the imprints left by habits of self grasping. So once you've realized emptiness directly and you're on the path of seeing, then you're gradually removing obscurations, the afflictive obscurations both those that are naturally present and those intellectually acquired. And you continue to remove and remove along the path of meditation. And then before you're a Buddha, but you've already achieved Nirvana, right? So you've achieved a state beyond sorrow. You're no longer suffering. There's still a little bit of work to be done and that's getting rid of the imprints. So those imprints are called cognitive obscurations obscurations to knowledge, omniscient obscurations, or obscurations to omniscience. Those are all synonyms you'll hear. But basically just hear it as, you can get rid of all of the negative habits from afflictions and still have a bit of work to do because you have the habit of seeing things as inherently existent. So you don't believe it anymore, right? You don't believe that things are inherently existent anymore at this stage, but they still appear that way through the force of habit or imprints. Does that make a sense? So the, the description given often is if you look at your face in the mirror, you don't believe that there's another face in the mirror, right? You don't believe that there's two people there who are identical looking at each other, right? We're not a cat, yeah? You look in the mirror, you don't think there's another face in the mirror, but it appears as if there's another face in the mirror. Does, yeah, does this analogy make sense to you, right? So you see the face, but you don't believe it's another face. You know it's just a reflection of your face. Similarly, when you have these imprints still, you see the appearance of true existence, but you don't believe it anymore. 
But in order to have full omniscience to be able to benefit all sentient beings, you need to be able to see beyond the appearance. Yeah, you need to be able to see ultimate truth and relative truth simultaneously to benefit all sentient beings. You need to be able to see what they see as well as to see emptiness at the same time. Before you're a Buddha, but you're an Arya being who has achieved the path of seeing, who has realized emptiness directly, you do see emptiness, but only while you're meditating on emptiness, right? Then you're out of your meditation and things still appear to be truly existent. Yeah, so it's, it's blocking you from this full knowledge that can benefit all sentient beings. But it's like the veil or the illusion is gradually dissolving and becoming less and less. Thoughts on that? Questions about that? Yeah. That, that's probably just, that's just the fault of my presentation, right? I haven't had enough coffee. It's, um, <laughs> it's very joyful, right? Um, I mean, just picture it, okay? Picture it. If you saw more of reality, um, then you would know more about what is useful and what isn't. And that would be very helpful and free up a lot of energy, wouldn't it? Right? So if you were looking at your family and you understood what all of them were thinking and you were understanding all of their tendencies and traits, it would be much easier to know right now they need a hug, right now they don't need a hug, right? Right now they need to eat something and then we'll talk, right? All of those basic things would be much more obvious. You wouldn't have to guess. And that would be happy knowledge, right? That would be something really uh, joyful for you. But also you would see the whole expanse of suffering and everybody's negative patterns. And so that could be quite overwhelming as well. But the main thing that's happening once you realize emptiness is that instead of just gradually purifying negative karma, you're purifying negative karma in huge bursts. So basically, like when you meditate on emptiness, loving kindness, all these good things at our level, that creates positive karma and it also can purify negative karma if we do it in the right way. Just gradually getting the job done. Once you've realized emptiness, instead of like burning a little negative seed one by one, it's like you've got a blowtorch and you're just torching the whole set of seeds, right? Each meditation, eons of negative karma being burnt up eons of negative karma that can result in suffering, that can result in negative states of mind, et cetera, et cetera, just a blowtorch burning through all those seeds. So once you realize emptiness, you become so much more efficient in your purification. So you're having less suffering results, right? So also that is happening, not just the present moment able to see things is great, but actually you have fewer negative karmas able to ripen. And so once you've taken a blowtorch to all the seeds, you've completed your path of a meditation, then you still have the seeds there being stinky, right? So they're not um, causing you suffering. They're not um, leaving the habit of afflictions anymore, but they still just a little kind of a presence of them that is making you unable to be fully omniscient. And so then you need to be able to decimate the seeds completely. Yeah, throw them into the sea, they dissolve, blah, blah, blah. That's, you know, a rough analogy, right? So that's good news, right? It's good news. So I apologize if it doesn't sound like good news, it's great news and you will be very happy, <laughs> right? I mean, just if we get bodhicitta, we're gonna be so much happier because we're gonna be so much less obsessed with ourselves and self-conscious and neurotic, right? Just bodhicitta, not even realizing emptiness yet, we're gonna be way happier. Yeah, as well as way more effective. And realizing bodhicitta, it, this is achievable for us in this life. It is. Yeah, we can do it. Um, it just takes thorough habituation, right? Again and again, in order to benefit all sentient beings, in order to benefit all sentient beings. Because we're already on the right track with wanting to live an altruistic life. We just need to make it more intentional. Yeah, and maybe we can realize emptiness in this life. We might be able to. Maybe we can become enlightened in this life, maybe. But it's hard to know how much negative karma we have and how many obstacles there will be. But I think, you know, thinking that bodhicitta might be possible in this life means that your next life, you're gonna come in with this tendency of bodhicitta rock solid, yeah? And you're gonna just pick up where you left off and continue your path. For us, 
before we realize bodhicitta, we have some good tendencies that we came in with and some negative tendencies that we came in with, and we have to relearn a lot. Yeah. Do you ever feel like when you go to a Dharma class, that's a topic that you've never heard before, that there's still something kind of familiar about it. Like you're relearning something that you already learned, you know, it's just kind of like, Oh yeah, I knew that, but actually I've never learned that. But part of me knew that sometimes this can happen with imprints. Um, and so instead of like having to like drag up from the dredges, some old knowledge you used to know, dust it off, shine it off and then increase it. You'll come in with, I remember that kindness is the main thing. I remember compassion is the way to orient life. This is the way I am, despite what I'm taught by my parents, despite the traumas that might happen to me, I know it. Yeah, you come in with that knowing and it's a joyful knowing. So we wanna to get to that point where our habits are strong enough that we don't have to relearn them with as much effort. They just kind of wake up, yeah, and then can be developed. Yeah, how much of the learning of this life would you forget if you were just in a coma for two years? You know, how much of the learning of this life would you forget if you were a dog for 20 years? You know, you'd remember some tendencies and some traits, but so much of the details would just fall away. Yeah, so we want really, really strong positive habits. Yeah, and if you don't think about future lives, you can think about the legacy you leave the people around you. Yeah, yeah I don't know. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Can I ask a question about uh, bodhicitta? Yeah, yeah. So I have um, suddenly uh, a thought about um, the inflation of uh, bodhicitta. When inflation? maybe, yeah, yeah. Um, maybe, uh, you know, uh, when you talk about the, the one who are very uh, influenced from uh, authority, the family of uh, indefinite family. So they go uh, without uh, thinking and do what um, they are very influenced. And uh, maybe there is a stage in bodhicitta because it's very complicated to be a good bodhicitta because you have to give the other what they need and not what they ask. I mean, um, what they uh, request or they uh, demand. Maybe you have to, to be very focused about what they really need. And sometimes you, you give uh, or more than you can give, and then you begin maybe um, agitated or you give something that the other is not really um, uh, benefit from it. He think that it benefit him, but he doesn't. You, you, you understand my problem? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then uh, the question is what to do? If you can um, enlighten me about uh, the, um, the fake bodhicitta or the um, exaggerate bodhicitta or the um, not uh, enough um, a graduate bodhicitta. Yeah, you understand what I did? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll try and then you can ask a follow up question if I don't answer your question. So, um, you know, real bodhicitta is the main Mahayana motivation, it's the mind with two aspirations. It's the intention to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient things. Yeah, that, I know. That's real bodhicitta. And for it to be uncontrived or not artificial, it needs to be something that arises spontaneously. Mm -hmm. But for it to arise spontaneously, you have to consciously fabricate it. Yeah, you have to fake it until you make it, but not fake it in an artificial, plastic, ingenuine way, because we already do have compassion, right? Just as an ordinary person, whether we're Buddhist or not, we have some compassion already. We have some loving kindness already. We have them. So we take what we have, and then we try to stretch it to hold more people. We try to stretch it to hold a greater motivation for it. 
So you're taking what is real and true and already existent, and you're also trying to extract out the problems in your motivation that might be self-centered or egocentric, yeah, as well as this expansion and deepening process. So this is something that we can do already at our level today. In the second, if someone says, connect with bodhicitta, what you're really doing is waking up the loving kindness and compassion you already have, bringing it to the forefront of your mind, and then consciously expanding it using your intellect. Yeah, as well as kind of a sense of your heart opening. So, you know, if you think about, um, I don't know, the people starving in Yemen right now, immediately your heart opens to the people starving in Yemen right now. But before I said that, you know, in the background, we were worried about them and care about them, but it wasn't like in our consciousness, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, so you're consciously remembering the people of Yemen who are starving right now. So now they're in your heart and they're part of your bodhicitta practice because of intentionally remembering them. So you're not faking your care for them. You're fabricating your memory, yeah, to kind of bring it into your heart. But it's not like you're forcing them into your heart because you do genuinely care about their situation. Yeah, so you take that um, kind of as an example for your bodhicitta to keep coming back to that again and again, opening the heart, expanding, deepening the motivation, all of that. And it becomes so familiar that it becomes natural, right? So through habituation, everything becomes easier. We already know this from our life. We didn't used to know how to talk, right? And our mom and our dad made noises at us and shaped their mouths and, you know, did cute things. And we learned how to use our mouth and we learned how to talk. And now we talk without thinking, unfortunately, right? No, but we can talk very easily with great flow. Same with walking, right? So we forget how much effort it took to learn these things. Yeah, because now it's like effortless, you know, except for when we haven't had enough sleep and we're like, oh, but you know, so, so remember that. I'm, I'm talking about uh, the opposite. The people who are very, very uh, large in the, in the heart, it's not, they don't need to, to, um, uh, to think about, they, they see somebody and, and they want to help him. It's it's not that uh, they have to yeah, think connect about it. to they, they are connected. But when when they they uh, help the other, maybe it's sometimes too much for them or for the other. Yeah, because it's it's not it's not bodhicitta. It's um, it's compassion. It's sometimes what is called unfortunately is called idiot compassion, which mm. is like knee jerk. Right, I just, I must help because a good person helps. I must help because my identity is a helper. I must help because I genuinely want to help, but I actually have no idea what is helpful, right? Mm -hmm. And this is not bodhicitta, right? This is, it happens, it happens to all of us, but it's divorced from wisdom, mm. right? So we have to always have wisdom and compassion together. You know, remember like the essence of Omani Peme Hum mantra that we do, the essence of it is to become enlightened, you need compassion and wisdom united. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one without the other is not strong and it's not skillful. Compassion without wisdom becomes idiot compassion and you help above and beyond your capabilities. You help in a way that's not skillful, et cetera, et cetera. Wisdom without compassion becomes very cold, becomes too intellectual right? So you need them together for awakening. Yeah. So, you know, this is why just, you know, Omani Pemi Hum, Omani Pemi Hum, Omani Pemi Hum is very powerful because really you're saying wisdom and compassion must always be united. Yeah. Wisdom and compassion must always be united. This is the path to awakening. Yeah. So, so for us, you know, a danger can be um, trying to do the behaviors of bodhicitta without the motivation of bodhicitta because that's what we should be doing and it's not coming from the heart first it's coming from the words first or the actions first mm -hmm. um, and then it becomes inauthentic and it becomes uh, brittle it becomes um, something that has limited effect um, you know and sometimes it's just being polite when you're having a bad day but what we need to try and do is to start with the heart first and then the words and the actions flowing from that rather than what should I say? What should I do? 
don't worry about what you should say and what you should do. First connect with your heart. Yeah, then say and do from that place. It's gonna be a lot more effective. Does that make sense? Yeah, other, other questions about that, Bodhicitta? It'll keep coming up. <laughs> so um, we're gonna continue on. Um, causal characteristics. The causal characteristics of the family are described as awakened and unawakened. The awakened family has achieved the fruit perfectly and the signs are very obvious. The unawakened family has not achieved the fruit perfectly and its mark is not obvious. What would cause this family to awaken? This family can awaken through freedom from unfavorable contributory causes and through the support of favorable conditions. If the opposites occur, they cannot awaken. There are four unfavorable conditions, being born in unfavorable circumstances, having no habitual tendency toward enlightenment, entering into wrong conditions, and being heavily shrouded by the obscurations. There are two favorable conditions, the outer condition of a teacher and the inner condition of a mind with the proper desire for the precious dharma and so forth. So unawakened, again, is, is talking about basically a potential that is much obscured or like sleeping or dormant um, or suppressed. Yeah, a potential that's suppressed because the conditions have just made things way too hard, right? And so if we can remember that conditions have an influence, a very strong influence, but conditions never have the power to destroy the potential for enlightenment. Yeah, yeah, conditions never have the power to destroy your potential, but they do have an effect of suppressing its development if there's just too many hardships. So we do see this all the time, don't we? If people are really, really hungry or really, really hot or don't have enough space, it is harder to be compassionate to one another. You know, isn't it the case that uh, wars usually happen in the summer? Yeah, it's too hot. Yeah, we must fight. Too hot. Yeah, or, um, you know, just thinking about um, there's how kind you can be when things aren't hard. And then there's how kind you can be when things are really, really disruptive in your life. And a sign that you're well trained or a sign that you're well developed is that you can maintain your kindness even when things are hard. But right now it's, it's important to recognize that with very difficult conditions, our good qualities have a harder time coming through. It doesn't mean that we don't have them. It doesn't mean we need to look down on ourselves if they're not coming through. But, you know, look that conditions do have an effect. Yeah, so these conditions that are described are very obvious um, and easy to understand, right? Um, you just don't have the habit of transformation. Then it's just going to be harder to develop it, isn't it? doesn't mean you can't. Um, entering wrong conditions, you know, wrong conditions can be of so many types, but basically just being surrounded by people who don't care, right? Surrounded by apathy, it's very easy to be apathetic. Um, being heavily shrouded in obscurations, you're having a lot of, um, basically the tendencies from past lives are just making it very hard for the light to come through. Yeah. Um, oh, and the first one I jumped over, being born in unfavorable circumstances. This is like being born to a family where there's a lot of violence or being born in an area where violence is tolerated and encouraged. Um, being born in a place where um, substance abuse is the norm, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, so stuff like that doesn't mean you can't awaken. It just means those are conditions that suppress potential. So this is very obvious to you guys because this is the kind of work you deal with all the time. Yeah, but um, maybe it's reassuring to see that it's named in Buddhism as well. So the favorable conditions are basically a teacher and a tendency. Yeah, having a teacher that helps and a tendency to do it. Yeah, those are the things that really support development. And... Um, the teacher doesn't have to be, you know, at least in the beginning, doesn't have to be a capital T teacher, guru, lama sort of thing. But eventually that's going to really make things more efficient. Um, you know, basically a book can be your teacher, you know, or an online interaction can be a teacher. And then eventually a real life teacher helps a lot. Um, but basically the tendency, um, otherwise having a teacher won't matter. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then the marks, any questions about that? The causal characteristics, basically just a discussion of conditions.
Yes, I, I forgot. The tendency is what we uh, um, related in other lives, in past lives. In past lives, in this context, but you could say tendencies you've developed over your life so far as well. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's also, it's something that we see all the time too, of if your family um, has a values education, it's probably a lot easier for you to become well-educated than if your family didn't value education and you're the first one to go to university. You know, th there's also tendencies background conditions like that, right? So the tendencies of a family also make your own tendencies flow. Um, if you have a kind and compassionate family, it's much easier for your kindness and compassion to be nurtured and to flourish. Doesn't mean that you can't have your kindness and compassion nurtured and flourish by other things, but you know, conditions have an influence. So tendencies of past lives, also tendencies of this life. Um, and background conditions that support those. So then the marks, um, the marks of this family are the signs which indicate the Bodhisattva family. The Ten Noble Bhumis Sutra says, the family of, of wise Bodhisattvas can be recognized by its sign, just as fire is known by its smoke and water is known by water birds. So this sounds very poetic, but this is um, also a a classic logic that we use when we start to learn debate, right? So how do you know if there is fire on a smoky mountain pass? Because there is smoke, you know? You see the smoke, you infer fire, right? You see water birds, you infer there's water there, right? Um, so in that case, what kinds of marks are there? Their bodies and speech are naturally gentle without dependence on a remedy. Their minds are less deceitful, have loving kindness and clarity towards sentient beings. So to say their bodies and speech are naturally gentle, it's, you know, as you would assume, just logically, not harsh, right? So they don't have to be any kind of beauty or anything. It's, it's that the way they use their features is kind. Yeah, the way they use their speech is kind. Um, there's one um, teacher in our community who has a very broad Australian accent and who is very loud and who uses a lot of slang and a lot of swear words, but still you can feel the compassion coming through it. So again, it's not like, it's not harsh in terms of like objectively harsh from a worldly perspective. It's about the kind of compassion you can feel through it. So someone can speak in a very sweet, very gentle way and not be what's described here. It could just be totally passive aggressive, right? So, you know, don't misunderstand. It's saying kind of what's flowing through the voice and what's flowing through the body. Yeah. Okay. So over the page, thus the Ten Noble Bhumi Sutra says, no harshness or arrogance, avoiding all deceit and cunning, having a clear loving attitude toward all sentient beings. This is a bodhisattva. So no harshness or arrogance is quite obvious. Avoiding all deceit and cunning, so it's like they're not manipulative, right? Not manipulative, not calculating, not trying to like win people over in a creepy way, right? Someone whose communication is very clean, yeah? So this is something that I think we're all trying to aspire to, is to have very clean, very direct, very honest way of communicating. Um, you know, communicating that way to ourselves, as well as communicating that to others, whether in words or in deeds. But just being very clear and not, um, you know, I think for polite, kind, grown up people, being passive aggressive is a tendency we can all fall into where we're saying one thing, but wanting people to infer another and to kind of weaponize our words in a way that's kind of sneaky or mean because we're not, um, honest or brave enough to just say what a conflict is and address it. We do these kind of little sneaky back routes. Um, so it doesn't mean that you have to be um, free from conflict. It means that you're free from deceit and cunning, right? And that means that you can deal with conflict in a clean, clear way, not um, full of all of your afflictions. Do you know what I mean? So, so for us aiming for both verbal speech and then what is communicated by all of our other ways of being, to be as free from manipulation as possible, to be as free from passive aggressiveness as possible, um, direct, you know, say what you mean, 
you know, this is a really important part of the path. What do you think about that? Make sense? No? Tick, okay, good. In other words, whatever preparatory actions a bodhisattva undertakes, they always cultivate compassion for all sentient beings, has great inclination towards the Mahayana teachings, has no hesitation to endure hardships, and perfectly performs the root virtue of the perfections. Thus, the ornament of Mahayana Sutra says, developing compassion at the preparation stage, devoted interest, patience, perfectly performing the virtues, these are the sign of the Mahayana family. So the first line I think is important, developing compassion at the preparation stage. That's us, right? That's us, we're trying to develop compassion, which is kind of a sign that we're already altruistically motivated, right? So I think this is a, you know, kind of a little way to highlight this is our family, I think. Yeah, otherwise we wouldn't be in teachings like this interested in what we're interested in. Um, and if that doesn't ring true and you are anti-compassion, it's okay, you're not a lost cause. Okay, <laughs> slowly, slowly. Thus, of these five families, those who are in the Mahayana family are very close to the cause of enlightenment. The hero and solitary realizer families will eventually lead to Buddhahood, but its cause is farther away and it will take a long time. In the indefinite family, some are close and some will take a long time. The disconnected family is known by Buddha to wander in samsara for a long time, but this does not mean they will absolutely will not attain Buddhahood. They can attain Buddhahood, but it will take a very long time. Therefore, since all sentient beings belong to one of these families, all sentient beings are of the Buddha nature. Thus, by the above three reasons, it has been demonstrated that all sentient beings have the Buddha nature. Furthermore, consider these examples, silver abiding in its ore, oil abiding in a mustard seed, and butter abiding in milk. From silver ore, we can produce silver, from mustard seed, we can produce oil, and from milk, we can produce butter. Likewise, sentient beings can become Buddhas. This is the first chapter dealing with the primary cause from the jewel ornament of liberation, the wish-fulfilling gem of the noble teachings. Okay, so, done. <laughs> right? Done. Dispositions from the sutra perspective, done um, in terms of just kind of getting our head around it. Um, so this is, it's an important thing to sit with. We won't belabor it because I think um, this is the sort of thing that you guys will understand quite quickly. But um, there's on page 36, um, there's a continuation of this, uh, this teaching. And um, so if you'd like to read it, it's on page 36 to 37. Um, if you wanna read it before Monday, that would be great. Um, but uh, I think you got the gist of it. And then if for some reason this is very intriguing to you and you're really into it, then this book on Buddha nature, you could read the whole chapter. So the whole chapter on disposition is chapter two. So if you want to read all of chapter two, if you're like really interested in this stuff, then it's in this commentary, but um, that's optional. It's really if you're just in the mood. Okay. Antonin, what book is the um, topic about faith you mentioned last uh... Session? This one too, it had the, um, there was a note in the back um, on page 55. Note. Types of faith, yeah, um, note number 15 in page 55. Yeah, of this one. Mm -hmm. And so now I want you to jump to a, a debate section, okay, because debate's fun. All right, page 71 of your text. Jumping. So we're going to jump to this section periodically when it makes sense to do so. On page 71, this is... Um, of enlightenment. It's saying that everyone has the primary cause, and then there's a huge variation of condition. Yeah, yeah. So everyone has the primary cause, everyone has the seed of enlightenment, but then how that's going to flourish, how it will be watered, it's, there's a lot of variation because beginningless time, we've gotten up to all sorts of things. Yeah. 
Yep. So um, this common questions and debates, maybe we'll start with it on Monday, but if you're curious, you can read ahead. Basically, it's a, it's a discussion of what is this clear light mind that we all have? Um, and it's from um, this book by His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. And in the back of the um, section that's in your handouts is a link to, um, you can uh, get it on internet archive and you can, you know, like get it from the internet archive library and have it for 14 days. So it's a very easily accessible thing, but I pulled out the highlights and put it in your course material. So this book um, is called um, The Buddha Nature, Death and Eternal Soul in Buddhism. And it's tiny, and it looks like it's something for beginners, but it's one of um, Children and I's favorite books. We read it all the time, and we argue about it all the time. It's one of our favorites, and it's really short, but um, it's a really cool book. And so if you like it, that's there. So clear light is an important piece of this whole discussion of Buddha nature, so we'll keep coming back to it. Um, but probably we'll start Monday with this section. Um, yeah, good. Okay. So we'll just take a minute and let everything sink in. And so all of this discussion about disposition, all this discussion about cause and effect, just think, what is some wisdom that I've touched that I can bring into the rest of the day? Common questions and debates from the Buddha nature. Dr. Peter Michel, question. In France last year, you said clear light should not be confused with a creator concept such as Brahman. Tantric tradition explains the Dharmakaya through the concept of clear light or the true nature of the mind. This means that all phenomena, samsara and nirvana, manifest from this clear and shining source. Therefore, one can say that this highest source, the clear light, is close to the concept of a creator, but one should be careful. When I speak about a source, it should not be misunderstood. I do not mean that somewhere a form of concentrated clear light exists as a substrate, similar to the non-Buddhist idea of Brahma. This shining space must not be deified. If this holds true, how is the clear light, which is the essence of the individual being, connected to the limited personality of this being? His Holiness says, if you investigate and try to find out where this clear light mind is, you will be able to find it only within an individual person. For example, we speak about human beings. They are born. This means each human being is born as an individual and has his own experience of birth. At the same time, however, we speak of human beings collectively. The same goes for consciousness. What we identify as the clear light always belongs to an individual. It is not Brahman or universal soul, since each individual's future and present experiences are based on that clear light. It is not appropriate to say that the clear light acts almost like a creator. This does not mean that a separate, isolated, universal clear light exists somewhere. Question. Can the clear light be seen as something active? His Holiness. No. In our normal states, we cannot call clear light active. Through meditation or training, however, once we intentionally experience the manifestation of clear light, it can be used for perceiving or realizing objects. Perhaps, at that particular point, you could call the clear light mind active. Question. Does the clear light exist as a potential in every living being? Answer. No, it is always there. You can compare it with water. When water is muddy, the purity of the water is still there. But because the water is mixed with dirty substances, you cannot identify it. If the pure water were not there, the muddy water could not exist. 
The existence of the dirty water itself proves that the pure water is its basis. At this moment, the clear light is inactive, but it exists. Because clear light is there, the different states of consciousness and constituent factors can arise. Question. My main difficulty with this philosophy is understanding how the clear light can become unknown. How can a living being forget its Buddha nature if it's always there? His Holiness. Our everyday consciousness is on a very gross level. When we think, I say this, I know that, we are referring to a very gross level of consciousness. All the thoughts are on such a level. At present, the gross level of consciousness is active and the clear light level is innate. When the clear light becomes active, the gross level becomes inactive. For this reason, when we are in a deep, dreamless sleep, we are not aware of it, although we experience it. If we have a clear dream, we can remember dreaming this or that the next day. After sleeping deeply without dreaming, we wake the next morning feeling hardly any time has passed. We sleep soundly, and after waking, look at our watch and see that several hours have passed, but it feels like just a moment. This shows that our mind has different levels. Question. How can Buddha consciousness, which exists from the very beginning, fall into a state in which it forgets itself? For example, a Buddha was not a Buddha from the very beginning. He developed, thus there was only a seed at the beginning. Has the seed an evolutionary force in it? His Holiness. No, this seed has existed as long as consciousness has existed. Consciousness has no beginning. Life has no beginning. Question. How does a person become a Buddha if there is no beginning? Do we have the wrong sense of time here? His Holiness. One becomes a Buddha through transformation of the mind. However, you do not have to transform the clear light mind. It is already there. Question. We have to transform the unclear mind into the clear mind? Is that how it can be expressed? It is it like changing the dirty water to clean water? How does this happen? His Holiness. Through purification by removing ignorance. Question. That makes sense, but how did this clean water become dirty in the first place? His Holiness. The clear light mind becomes shrouded or unclear because of our inborn ignorance, which also exists since beginningless time. The concept of beginningless mind or of beings living since beginningless time cannot be proven directly by itself. His Holiness continues, We must look at it another way around. If you accept the beginning of living beings, then the question is, how did this begin? What was the cause? The assumptions of a beginning gives rise to a number of contradictions. Question. Does the quotation from the Pali Canon at the beginning of our interview about something unborn, uncreated, and unmade refer to the clear light mind? His Holiness. No. There, Buddha is teaching the non-self or selflessness of person, meaning the non-existence of an absolute independent self. He is referring to the emptiness and not to the selflessness in the sense of not being selfish. The Pali Sutras of the Theravada and the Sanskrit Sutras of the Mahayana always refer to emptiness as the unborn, unabiding, unceasing. These all relate to non-self or selflessness. In Tantra, the subtle mind of clear light is also called unborn and uncreated. Even though on the conventional level there is good reason for doing so, as this mind is without beginning, however, this is an exception. Generally speaking, when one talks about a phenomena that arises and ceases as being free of arising and cessation, one is referring to the ultimate mode of existence of that phenomena, its non-self. There is no other way of interpreting this.